Well, the Facebook algorithm gods decided to send me a video yesterday of a King Air jump plane spinning with skydivers. <laughs> what? Stick with me on FlyerWire as we look at that frame by frame. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on FlyWire, we're going to look at an inadvertent spin, at inadvertent spins, two of them actually, and airplanes not cleared for them. First up is a DC-3 being used as a jump plane. Okay, I thought for a minute that, uh, you know, I should ask Dan Greider of Probable Cause, you know, he's a DC-3 guy, is this a standard maneuver for jump DC-3s? Yeah, but I decided, nah, this has to be a non-standard maneuver. I'll look at it myself. The report I had on this event was that it happened almost 30 years ago, maybe to Dan, <laughs> someplace in the U.S. The jumpers were getting out of 12,000 feet when the spin happened and the pilots did not recover from the dive until 4,000 feet. What we don't know, frankly, is how far above the ground that was, yikes, or the speed attained in the dive. You know, a couple of things there. Let's look at the film. Well, one thing I can say is that it all happens really fast. I bet that that got the attention of the pilots. You know, woof. First thing I noticed is that the ailerons are deflected. Okay, here's the thing. To spin an airplane, technically, to depart controlled flight, you need two things in sequence. You need stall and then yaw. We can argue about it till the cows come home, but you need, the, need it in those, basically, that pattern. With the perspective of the camera on the jumper's head, you can see other jumpers on the wing and the airplane at a very high pitch angle in relation to the horizon. When the wing breaks, meaning the boundary layer becomes detached at the as the critical angle of attack is exceeded, the airplane, the airplane slices to the left and the jumpers come off the wing with other jumpers vomiting out of the cargo door. I don't know any other way to put it. <laughs> with the ailerons deflected, there is extra drag, and some of it is adverse yaw. When you take into account the, the self-loading variable drag devices, mm, skydivers, crawling out on the wing and breaking up the boundary layer on the inboard section of that wing, you're asking for a stall, not to mention riding that very edge of controlled flight, as in what's going to happen. This is a very good demo of what happens when you go over that edge. Didn't plan on it, but you did anyway. The second thing I noticed about this three was that the gear was down. I presume that, presume that was for the extra drag. I can't quite tell from the poor quality of the pre-HD video camera, but it looks like a little flap may be deployed as well. The three uses a split flap, which is pretty much all drag and no lift. Not sure it would have helped in this situation. Best to be up. With the gear and maybe some flap out, that extra drag means the wing would stall earlier Add those self-loading drag devices and you have all the fixings for an accelerated stall, meaning one that happens at a faster speed than a clean wing would stall. Uh, I also see that the aileron is deflected left wing down into the spin. This is actually not a pro spin input, but will result in a higher roll rate, which makes the auto rotation faster. You think you're spinning faster. I guess you are in a way. And the video shows the airplane made its one turn, and it did one turn, very fast. In order to be on the back side of the power curve with all that drag out there, I'd be willing to bet the power is up on both engines. Power is a pro spin input, and when that power thrust line is displaced out on the wing, that, and this is a twin engine airplane, there's also a rolling yawing moment imparted on the wing from that power, especially when, once it departs. Significantly, the ailerons are neutral. He didn't try to make it spin. And uh, in this shot, I noticed that the rudder is deflected to the left. You can't really tell whether it is before this shot, but here it is left. And that's pro spin. 
Okay, that's how I start a spin when I want to start one. <laughs> Given what I imagine is a very high shock factor in the cockpit at this point, I mean, DC-3s aren't meant to point straight down at the ground. I suspect that the pilots are not really recognizing the situation that's stabilizing the spin. I think they, they, everything stayed where they were. In this shot, we see that the pilot has controls deflected to stay in the spin. Maybe cause it. I was taught that when the airplane departs control flight, the first thing you do is pull the engine to idle, powers pro spin, neutralize the ailerons, again, ailerons are pro spin, and hold the elevator full aft. This stabilizes the spin and allows the, as much relative wind access to the rudder as possible. And then you figure out the direction of the spin and push on the opposite rudder. When the yaw stops, recover from the dive, and that recovery is done with the neutral ailerons and rudder so you don't get into a crossover spin, a secondary stall followed by another spin in the opposite direction. Here it appears that in this shot that the rudder has been neutralized and hopefully the ailerons as well. The rudder and aileron are neutral in this shot and the yaw rate has stopped. The spin is, was not fully developed and, and this is what is called the incipient phase of the spin, just neutralizing the controls basically resulted in the airplane recovering from the spin. But now it has an extreme nose down attitude. Not good. The airplane is in full dive mode now and the landing gear is still out. This is good and bad at this point. The gear won't affect the wing flying as much as in this attitude. <laughs> and the extra drag will keep the air speed down somewhat. But once again, I can't see if the flaps were out at all, but the flaps were not a good thing to have out at all when you're trying to recover from a stall. When you're trying to get smooth air flow over the wing, the disruption of the flaps delays that process. Delay is not a good thing when you're pointed straight at the ground. If, in, if the engines were left at high power settings, that would have let, tended to offset the drag of the gear and more speed is not a good thing in this situation. Just for grins, let's look at the, uh, another jumpers video as they shuffle out of the plane. That's a lot of folks. It's a good thing the door was so big. I mean, I mean seriously, do you see what I mean? <laughs> it looked like they were vomiting out of the, out of the airplane. Was that fun or what? <laughs> I would suspect for the pilots it wasn't. So let's set up the next jump plane spin. Sorry, I'm laughing. Uh, nobody was hurt in filming that video. This one is a King Air C90 in South Africa on 14 October 2021. There were 14 qualified skydivers as passengers on the airplane and one pilot. The jump run was at 16,000 feet, so the air was pretty thin. You know, they had that going for them. And the skydivers were focused on getting out, hanging on, getting into their positions for the release so they could all go together and do what they had planned on doing. You know, they didn't expect a Spanish Inquisition, uh, I mean, a stall and a spin. The report was that of the six on the outside of the airplane, only one or two had ever experienced a stall in a jump plane, and they did not recognize the telltales, the vibration, et cetera. The, and in other words, they hung on a bit too long. And, force the airplane into that stall in the spin. As you watch this, you're gonna see a total of nine skydivers make it out of the airplane initially, the six outside and then three in the door, and then they made it out a little later, meaning that four remained in the airplane throughout the event. So after successfully getting out of a spinning airplane, what would you do if you were one of those skydivers? Well, of course, you'd follow through with your plan. I mean, you're in the air, you got a jump going, so you do your formations and have your fun. Because, you know, that's a past. That's gone. We're away from that airplane. Before we get started, though, I'd like to relay from those involved that the airplane was not hurt, bent, hurt, not bent. No one was hurt during the event. And they have modified their jump procedures to prevent another departure like this in the future. And that's good news. There were some notes on this in social media regarding the setup from a jumper, I think it was the video guy, as well as the pilot. The pilot says the flaps were set at 60 to 80. What's what? which looks like about two thirds to me. The left engine was at flight idle or the left prop in course. The right engine power was up to maintain altitude as the whole jump sequence would take about 60 seconds at 90 knots indicated. That was a fair amount of right rudder applied to maintain level flight for a fairly long time. 
uh, as I mean, those are all a pro spin setup right there as we go. So let's watch this film, film in real time, and then we're going to look at it at the sequence frame by frame. Now that looked like an e-ticket ride to me. I guess that's dating myself if you've ever been to Disney World. Um, so here's the setup as the jumper with the video camera gets ready to get out the door. I will say that the cloudscape is beautiful. You can see the flaps down, some right aileron to keep the uh, left wing up, and that engine is probably, the left engine is probably at flight idle already. Just incredible views. Good detail. This is a good camera. The jumpers start climbing out into an incredible sunset. And here's a good shot showing the left aileron deflected to hold that wing up. Okay, remember what we said about adverse shot? As the jumpers crawl out, you can see the airplane, aircraft pitch up in response. You just look at that left wing tip. And in this shot, you can see the left wing dropping. The airplane is departed. Then the nose is slicing to the left as the wing drops. It's departed. It's not flying anymore. Here's a great shot of the spin developing. The aileron is still deflected. I gotta say, I really like this camera. It, it really captures the beauty and detail of everything, especially in the background and of what's happening to the airplane. And I also need to give a shout out to the jumper with the camera. He or she really does a great job of keeping the airplane and most of the jumpers in the frame just about all the time through the whole event. I mean, it, it's impressive. In this shot, the airplane is beginning to auto-rotation. No changes in the airplane configuration, and at this point, a trained pilot, at, for a trained pilot, they would have automatically been neutralizing controls and unloading the airplane. This would have inhibited the auto-rotation a moment of the outside wing in relation to the inside wing that stalled and stopped the spin dead in its tracks, called a spin prevent. This is an awesome video sequence, by the way. To be able to capture this up close and personal is just tremendous. Uh, for me. Uh, and in this shot, the video jumper works to keep the airplane in the frame, and we can see the different settings of the left and the right prop. There isn't enough footage of both engines to re reliably say whether the power had been actually pulled back on the right engine or not to match the left and idle, flight idle. But we can definitely see the difference in prop pitch, and this will have an effect during the pullout. In my opinion, I think it was a player. And this shot is an, it's an, another awesome shot of the other jumper, jumpers beginning to separate from the airplane. I mean, it's not, you just don't see this every day. What is important to note here is that the airplane configuration has not changed. There is no idle neutral aft to stabilize the spin. The flaps are down, and that contributes to the delayed recovery in this sequence. Flaps down delay the boundary layer, remember? It delays the boundary layer reattaching during the recovery. They act as an air dam, essentially, that creates, that increases the chaotic flow, and that delays the reattachment of the boundary layer, which is lift, and that delays getting the wing flying again. And that is a problem when we think it should be otherwise. In this shot, the airplane's rolling over on its back, and the jumpers are falling away. 
I mean, this is, it, it, you couldn't have planned this. And here we can clearly see the rudder displaced to the right. The elevators look neutral, and a really close examination shows the aileron still look deflected. In my opinion, that's what it shows. And this shot shows uh, the airplane has done one more complete rotation, so it's done two full departed turns. The right rudder is still deflected, the ailerons are neutral, and one would presume that by now the power has been pulled to idle. Okay, the pilot did say he did that with the clarity. This shot shows the airplane has stopped rotation and begins the dive portion of the recovery. The jumpers are trying to stay above the path of the airplane. From a physics standpoint, I think it is a great demonstration of, that, of the fact that objects in free fall, it doesn't matter what their mass is, they fall at the same rate. In this case, the jumpers have their arms and legs extended, which increases their drag moment or drag puller, showing their descent rate, which slows their descent rate, but just barely. There are so many cool things about this video that I'm, I'm just physics geeking over it. I apologize. <laughs> It's, it's tremendous. You just, how do you, how do you do this? I'd love to get shots like this. At this point, the airplane did two turns in the first departure and is in the dive recovery phase. phase. Flaps are still down, and the pilot credits that extra drag from the flaps for keeping the, air, air, the speed acceleration low. And he's right about that, but here in this, here we are a second or so later, and the airplane is departing again. I suspect the pilot decided that it was time to put a halt to these shenanigans and level off. Done with this. Which means he pulled too hard and he stalled the airplane yet again. That's a secondary stall. For the first time, the first time, frankly, it wasn't really his fault, but this one was. This time he pulls before the wing is ready to fly. Again, remember the flaps. And the rudder is still displaced to the right, so... Hmm. What happens? Well, the airplane begins to spin to the right. That's a crossover stall. It's a classic. I've seen it happen with students a bunch of times. The pilot gets over on his back, and it looks like he has finally neutralized control and unloads the elevator. The airplane responds and stops out of rotation. Thinking he has control again, the pilot rolls left to level the wings. And now in another dive phase, the pilots decide that it's once, time once again to put an end to the e-ticket ride and begins to pull again. I can just imagine him saying, ah, the airplane departs to the right yet again. The pilot claims that this, is this departure, as well as the one just prior, were due to one engine spooling up faster than the other. Frankly, I don't buy that explanation for the first secondary stall. And for this secondary stall to be caused by one engine producing more power than the other, it would have to be the left engine because it departs to the right. That left engine has the moment to make that airplane roll over to the right but that doesn't square with the prop pitch placement. Remember, the right was in fine and the left was in course. It would have taken more time for the left engine to spool up after being in idle than with the prop pulled back than the right, which was just at flight idle. The rolling moment would have been then to the right, but with the right one going, it would have been to the left. I have no doubt that one of the engines surged in this situation, but I do doubt this secondary stall was due to a power differential. It was a pull, in my opinion. This shot, well, it looks too much like a secondary stall caused by elevator, in my opinion. And in this shot, uh, at this point, it does look like the pilot has finally gotten a handle on the recovery. But here, one of the, one of the remaining jumpers inside decides that he's had enough and he gets out of the plane. Done with this. Unclear whether he joined the other group. The airplane levels out and starts for home. With all fairness to the pilot of this incident, I'm not surprised by the sequence of events. When we look at it frame by frame, we can see that the pilot did not react to, the recover, to recover the spin properly. And that resulted in the airplane staying in the spin longer and experiencing at least two subsequent secondary stalls. It's on the pilot. The vast majority of pilots these days have little experience or training in recovering from a severe upset like this one. And that's what it is. Spin, departure, it's an upset. Having done quite a few CFI spin endorsement, endorsements, I will also say that most CFIs have a, shall we say, incomplete understanding of spins and how to recover from them. I think this is a problem in our pilot population. 
maybe I'm alone. I will also say that the King Air recovered from the secondary stalls with nothing more than neutralizing the controls and opposite rudder that stopped the rotation in that first spin. Don't forget the pilot started the spin with the right rudder deflected already, and then he reported that he pushed it to the stop after departure. In other words, it was already there, and he just kept it there. I did leave some of, this, some of his commentary out because the video revealed a slightly different version of reality, and I don't want to hassle with that. I don't want to confront him. Again, not a big hit on the pilot. If you've never done these things, you just won't have the presence of mind to perceive what is really happening, and your brain tends to fill in the blanks. That's the way it is. Then, so what are the lessons learned from all of this? Well, I guess one of those lessons is to let fewer jumpers at a time crawl out on the wing of the fuselage, and the answer for the King Air folks is five. Let's play it right to the edge. Another is, is that the FAA call it certification standards work and airplanes not approved for spins can still recover from them. But for me, the biggest lesson is that training is the best thing to mitigate risk. Okay, in both of these jump plane spins, the departure was unexpected and errors were made. Even if you don't fly close to the edge, it is a good idea to have training for what to do when you go over it. You intentionally go over the edge. That's when bad stuff happens. My nickel on the grass is that you go get upset prevention recovery training not necessarily from me, from somebody else, do it. It's really, really good insurance. I think being prepared is the best insurance, but hey, that's just me. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.